Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michel Botman. Welcome to this uh, new presentation of OTF Connects titled Decolonizing Voice, Whose Voice Is It? with Matthew Sheehan of the Council of Ontario Drama and Dance Educator and Troy Maracle of the First Nation Métis and Inuit Education Association of Ontario. Uh, before we start our presentation, OTF is always asking us to do a quick land acknowledgement. Oh, my apologies. OTF is asking us to do a quick land uh, acknowledgement. So I'm going to read that. We acknowledge that we are gathered in the territories of various indigenous people, and we further recognize their stewardships of these lands in which we live, learn, work, and play. Um, I, would like, I would like to thank you all for um, telling us in the chat box where you are from. And I see that there are people from all over the province joining us today. And we are definitely thrilled to have each and every one of you with us. Um, and I can still hear people coming in one after the other. We have, 430, sorry, we have 236 people registered for this session. And I'm expecting that we're gonna get a, a, probably around 150 participants. So it's gonna be a really, really big and, and wonderful session. Um, we are thrilled to have all of you with us. And we are, um, of course, delighted to have uh, Matthew Sheehan and Troy Maracle with us uh, today for this new OTF Connects webinar. Uh, Matthew Sheehan, I'm gonna put his, his uh, this bio on just a quick second. There it is. Oh, sorry, I went one too fast. Matthew Sheehan is a drama and indigenous uh, study teacher at Prince Edward Collegiate Institute in Pinkton, Ontario. He's also the department head of the arts and indigenous studies and currently president, the president of the Council of Ontario Drama and Dance Educators. He has delivered workshops all over Ontario, including Code Conference, the OTF Curriculum Forum, and children and youth in performance at YPT, focusing on utilizing and responding to indigenous issues through drama without the appropriation of voice or culture. Uh, our other uh, presenter is uh, Troy Maracle. Troy is a husband and father of two. He is a member of the Kentege Kayen Kehaga or Mohawk of the Bay of Quinty, uh, more commonly referred to as the Tayendi Naga Mohawk territory, where he lives. Uh, he has been involved in ed indigenous education for the last 24 years as a classroom teacher, facilitator, and currently holds the position of indigenous education lead of the Hastings Prince Edward District School Board. He has worked as a consultant and writer for several publishers and, and has been involved in delivering professional development and indigenous education provincially, uh, in Indigenous Education Provincially with the Ministry of Education. Annually, Troy hosts a Provincial Indigenous Lead Gathering of all the leads working in Ontario school boards and has been involved with the First Nation Métis and Inuit Education Association of Ontario since its inception. Mathieu and Troy, please uh, accept my apologies and my French um, Inspector Clouseau uh, accent if I did not do uh, justice to, uh, to your bios. So that's it. We have now 137 people in the room, 236 have registered. So we're going to have a really fantastic session. And at this point, I'm going to invite, invite Troy to uh, um, click on his uh, button to unmute himself and uh, start the presentation. Thank you, Troy. Troy Youngat, Rado. A special shout out to Kayla. I see that uh, she sent me a quick note saying that she she has connections to Tainanega as well. And uh, you know, thank you so much, Michelle, for uh, for bringing those words of of acknowledgement to to our session today. And one of the things that I, you know Matt and I have have been working together for a number of years and, and that will come through as we go on today. But uh, one of the things that we, we often talk about is this acknowledgement of, of land. And uh, he will be speaking to that a little bit as well. But one of the things that we do as uh, Mohawk people, uh, we do something called the Ohandakarewedekwa. And what that is, it literally translates into the words that come before all others. And what we do, it is our, it's, 
it's our original instruction. It is about paying respect to all of the things that make it possible for us to survive, for us to live. So what that means is we pay our, our respect and thanks to everything. Uh, what One of the things that we also do is we, we say that as we're giving the opening address, we are leaving all of those things that we all might be carrying. We're at the end of a work day and we might have a lot of things that we're carrying. But what we're saying is that as we're going through the, the words, we're putting all of those things aside because what we're doing is we're bundling our minds together as one so that we can focus on what we're here for today. Now, unfortunately, I can't do this in my own language. That's a whole other story. But one of the things that I wanted to do is just to explain to everyone the process that we go through. And the first thing that we do is we give respect. We pay our respects and give thanks for all of the people who are, are with us today because it was meant to be. If you weren't meant to be here, you wouldn't be here. So we give our respects and, and, and thanks for all of the people who are with us today. Then we start at the, the, the land, at the earth. And we give thanks to all of the things from the earth all the way up into the sky. And that includes the land itself, the soil where that provides all of the nutrients. It includes the grasses that grow on those, the plant life, the food plants, the medicine plants, the trees. All of, we pay our respects to all of these things. We pay our respects to the animals that feed on those grasses and in, in the shrubbery and the trees that support the life for some of those animals. And not only that, but the water that sustains us all. We go through all of these things, paying our respects to the birds. The birds remind us, they bring us joy. Every, it's actually said that when the birds, when we hear the birds singing, it reminds us of our life and how good our lives are. So it makes us want to keep going. So we go through all of these things all the way up into the sky, talking about the giving thanks to the winds, giving thanks to the sun, to the moon, to the Radiweras, to the thunders that, that cleanse the air. We go through all of these things, including the stars. The stars play a major, major role in our society and in our, our cultures. Anyway, we go through all of those things, paying our respect and giving thanks for all of those things. Because see, without those things, we can't survive. So man is the least important thing. So we do all of this. We bring our minds together as one and we carry on for our day. So I appreciate you uh, taking uh, the time to be with us and I hope you enjoy uh, the learning. Over to you, Matt. So I want to uh, take a second and also um, thank everyone for being here this afternoon. <clears throat> I know it's been a long day for everyone and um, nothing says uh, dedication like spending a long day working in education or with kids or in whatever capacity you're working and then going, you know what I want to do? I want to spend more time with that. So that, that's a, that speaks a lot to every, everyone who's here today. Um, again, my name is Matthew Sheehan. I'm the president of the Council of Ontario Drama and Dance Educators. But first and foremost, I'm a classroom teacher. I teach drama and education, uh, English, and Indigenous studies. And it was through um, working as the Arts and Indigenous Studies department head that I met Troy. Uh, really met Troy. I'd seen him around, but uh, it's been 11 years ago, and we've been working together ever since uh, very closely. And um, not only is he someone I'm lucky to call a colleague, but someone I also consider a very close friend. And um, uh, he must feel the same way since he actually does return my text messages that I send at very strange times um, to him. Now, um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to open this by going to the CODE website, CODE in conjunction with FNMI EAO um, as our consultants and as our advisors and as the knowledge keepers to help us along, created our CODE call to action. And the reason why we decided to call it a call to action was that um, was in response to our discussions around 
wanting to make sure that a land acknowledgement wasn't just acknowledging the land and, and moving beyond that, but is something that would spark us to action as an organization and as individuals. So code acknowledges that our association spans land across Turtle Island, which is a traditional territory of many indigenous peoples. We honor them as the original storytellers and stewards of this land. May we never forget their legacies and may we learn well the lessons their descendants have to teach us about living on and with the earth. We will practice this sign of respect, acknowledge the rich history of these lands and indigenous nations, honor the truth of the past and uphold our original treaty, the two row wampum, to peacefully care for the land and each other through our drama and dance teaching practices. And I right now, I'm coming at you from the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Wendat here on peoples. And uh, reconciliation and acknowledgement is something I, I practice every day in my own teaching. I believe that's important to reinforce, uh, to find any path forward together. So I'm just trying to go back to our presentation here. <laughs> One second. If you click on the Hold on. I know, I know. Share share screen and then you should be able to to get back to it. Um, yeah. <clears throat> well, people will have to I have to apologize. I think people are sending uh, notes. I'm not gonna I'm I, I have to do better at looking at all the chats, but uh, no, I, know there's there's some I know exactly colleagues. what I'm doing. I know there's I know exactly some colleagues there. out there that are are uh, shaking their heads at my NFC. No, no they're not shaking their heads. It's all good, you know. But uh, certainly nice to see uh, lots of colleagues from around the province uh, that I've been fortunate enough to to meet and, and work with in in this in this work in this role. And uh, by all means, folks, I, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of knowledge out there, and we're really looking forward to this being a really interactive session. That we, sh we should say that. First and foremost, so you know, I'll jump right in here. And uh, one of the things that Matt and I like to to ask all the time is, why are you here? So as you can see, if people can go to that um, to the Jamboard and start plugging things in, that would be awesome. And I'm going to go to that Jamboard on our screen here, and um, I added four pages in anticipation of having several people here. Now, if you're unfamiliar with using Jamboards, um, if you hover over just under the arrow here, you'll see a sticky note application. And you can create a sticky note or you can put a text box in and just very quickly, like what brought you here today? And for, for Troy and I, I, I took the liberty of adding the first sticky note, which is to run a webinar on decolonizing voice, which seemed apparent, but I thought I should put that in there anyways. So if you could add just those reasons that we'd love to share with everyone. And I, as I, again, you can put it on any, any of these four pages. So we have one here to learn and to do better and to decolonize my practice. Uh oh, I saw something about there's too many people. I don't know. I thought it was, you know, we, we were just wanting to hang out some more. But you know what, if we could get some people, if you can't get on the jam board, if you could also put it in the um, chat as well, we'll go there and, and share some of that information. So just to share some of these, I am a visual art teacher. I love First Nation art. I have introduced my art students to this art. However, there's a lot more to learn, to learn more and to collaborate. Personal knowledge and learning and support my teaching practices and courses, CHC and NBE. Um, hello from your friends at OTF. Hello, friends at OTF. <laughs> to learn more about this topic and incorporate in, into my future teaching, to hear people's thoughts on the, on the matter, to incorporate more indigenous voices and perspectives in the teachings in my classroom. And then I'm going to go to the chat for a second here to see if I'm going to put in to further my learning to hear voices. And hello to Alana, who took uh, FNMI part two with me in the summertime. To support teachers in better understanding of the importance of this, incorporate it through the arts. To support teachers in better understanding the importance of this work, I want my students to know the history that was, I was never taught. That's a good reason. I, I often have these conversations with my mm -hmm. students around the mm -hmm. fact that they're learning things and discussing things that I did not discuss in the classroom when I was their age. I'm gonna go over a few more here before we, show, we are gonna move on and you can keep adding as we move on here. I teach grade eight, all subjects except French. I'm seeking more of an indigenous voice and resources to include in all my history and all subjects. And we're hoping that you'll get some of that today. Um, attended code fireside chat last week and heard about it. Wanna recognize and incorporate indigenous voices in, my, in the arts in my classrooms to learn more. 
And I love the fact that it's just right there, bam, to learn more. Yeah. To learn more and incorporate knowledge into my future classroom in the middle of an FNMI AQ and really realized how much I don't know. And you know what? Um, Troy and I will be the first ones here, here because Troy rocks. I agree with that. <laughs> Troy does rock. Um, but I'm hoping I can also prove to you that I also rock this evening, but we'll see. Um, if I don't, then just, just don't tell me. It'll bruise my uh, already fragile ego. Um, I think awesome. one of the best to do things the work. Yeah. to do the work, but also I think one of the best things that Troy and I will both also say is that the more you know, the more you'll also realize the more you just don't know and that there's so much to know and no mm -hmm. one can know everything. It's about keeping that open mind and exploring and being willing to learn more. Yeah, there's, there's other sentiments to that in the chat as well, right? In looking at looking at breaking down things. A lot of people have been lifelong learners, wanting to learn more, being open. It's, it, this is just amazing stuff, folks. All right, so I'm going to go back to the presentation here. So Michelle, when I had the drop, the drop down menu is not going away on the top so I can see my tabs. Like, how do I get that to go away? When I'm sharing my screen, like right here. So, you, so you, know, you mm -hmm. should see a, a share screen button. Do you see your share screen yep. button? Yep. You, you have to click on the share screen button, and then you should right. see a window open, and it, it, it should give you choices. Okay. It's just giving me my screen, but here, I have an idea. This will be faster. I'll just watch this. Watch this. Two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. And in the meantime, I want to tell everybody that uh, all of you that contributed in the chat box, um, we get a recording of the chat box and I will forward that recording to Matthew and to Troy so that they will be able to read all your entries mm. uh, tomorrow. Excellent. All right. So we're, uh, we're going to continue with a little bit of uh, participatory, participatory work here. And um, now that we learned that the Jamboard, uh, I'll be honest with you, I didn't know you had a maximum amount of participants and we have a lot of people here tonight. So um, uh, we're, we're going to ask on the Jamboard and in the chat um, so that we can get as, everyone sharing as much as possible. But I want you to take a second and really think about um, the, what we're asking here. And what we're asking for is for you to think about what reconciliation means to you. When you hear that word, what comes to mind? And when you have an answer to that, I would like you to, um, Michelle has just put the link to the second Jamboard in the chat. And um, the, some of you, if you could put that answer, and there's no wrong answer here. It's just the first thing that pops into your head when you hear the term reconciliation. I'm going to give you a second. I'll bring up that second jam board here so we can see as people are adding to it. I don't think I've ever done a jam board with so many people. <laughs> well, that's why like if you if you uh, are finding that you can't get on anywhere, just just type it right into the chat. So I'm going to stick with some things here. We have reconciliation is a constant process of revisiting and changing the way we interact with each other to recognize what we've done wrong in the past to try to learn as much as we can and move forward in a different way that's beneficial. Also from the chat, first it means ignore. Oh, moving on. First, it means acknowledging wrongs, harms was, was committed. Next, it means redressing the wrongs and moving forward. Learning, taking responsibility, healing. Mm -hmm. It's up to the colonizers to reconcile with what happened and learned. Truth, respect, mm -hmm. truth, peace, healing. Healing process of our community that acknowledges what, what we've done and learning from it. Acknowledging the past and moving forward as equal partners and learning together. We have quite a few in that jam board as well. Mm -hmm. To own up for mistakes and harm and amend relationships to move forward equally and respectfully. Nice. Writing wrongs. Yes. Nice. Acknowledge our role in colonialism and create new ways to coexist in ways that respect Indigenous sovereignty. And don't forget we have other, pa other pages here too. Acknowledging the past in order to build positive relationships. So as you can see, there are several different definitions or ways of knowing. And what, one thing I want to suggest mm. is that if, we're, if you were students working with Troy and I right now, there are several different things we could do with these definitions. Because we're starting with you. And we're starting with looking at your voice. 
And one of the things um, I've incorporated in my own practice, whether it's in English, Indigenous studies, or my practice predominantly as a drama teacher, is to come at students from where they're at. And to be perfectly honest, working in Picton, Ontario, at PECI, uh, we're predominantly, it's a rural school, predominantly Caucasian students. And, um, a, and the, a lot of the groundwork that Troy has laid in the elementary years, which has taken a long time of like, you know, working with uh, educators and then leading up to the secondary has helped create a good base moving forward. Now I find students who come to my classroom like uh, 10 years ago, they didn't know what a residential school was. And we'd have those initial conversations introducing them. Now they, ha they have an understanding, they have a grasp of the shared history and of the stories that we were not told. But one thing I would say that you could do with this, like the drama teacher in me looks at all these different definitions. And I think of the piece that we could put together, the movement piece we could put together, inspired by the words of our own students based on their understanding of reconciliation. The choral reading we could create based on our collective sharing of what it means to reconcile. And um, there's so many beautiful things put out here right now. I'm hoping that you can see the possibilities um, of accessing their own voices in response as a provocation, which is something that Troy and I are gonna talk about a lot tonight, provoking the learning and provoking responses. So one of the things I just, it, something caught my attention and I, okay. I, I, I wanna just speak to it a little bit because someone uh, reference the that reconciliation might be uh, empty. It might be an empty word, and that it's a tough one because I know that it has almost become a little bit of a of a buzzword, right? So I can see how some people are feeling that, and I guess for the purpose of of what we're doing is we're we're trying to bring that back to life. We're trying to make sure that it's not a buzzword that it's something that we are, are purposely aiming to do. And, and, and that's tough. It's, it's, a, it, it's a tough thing. Like some of us talk about uh, fatigue and some, some people I've actually heard say, well, I have reconciliation fatigue. Well, what is that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> anyway, we have to keep going forward. And uh, it's, as educators, we have to make sure that these that these actions and, and this is something viable moving forward, that it's alive and that we continue to keep going forward. But I just wanted to acknowledge that I did see that and, and I do understand that. So um, another question that came just changing gears here a little bit was around some of the terminology and I do this every time. It doesn't matter if I'm teaching uh, and working with grade one teachers or if I'm working with the trustees. It's something I always do is, is touch on, on terminology because, you know, a lot of people get hung up with that. And I think our audience today is, is, uh, is pretty clear on, on a lot of these things. This is an educated audience, but I'll just, I'll just really quickly go through it. So when I was born... I was born in Indian and later on I became a native and in the eighties, I became an Aboriginal. And then later in the nineties, two thousands, I became a first nations Métis Inuit, which was then shortened to an FNMI. And now I'm indigenous. So I always get the question asked. So, <laughs> right. So what do we call you? And of course, my answer is always Troy, of course. What else? Right? <laughs> Sorry, a little bit of a dad joke, but there's a lot of truth to it too. Because I have a little card in my wallet that says I am a status Indian and I will always be a status Indian. And that's true, right? To this day, and we still have to use that term sometimes is, is when we're talking about status or non-status Indian. We have to use that term when we're saying the Indian Act. It's just what we do. Native, on the other hand, that was a long time. Like I have a degree in Native Studies, right? But we've kind of let that one go because it's like anybody born in Canada is a Native Canadian. And you hear that in the States a lot. 
Native American. What are you Native American? Well, anybody born in America is, is American, Native American. So um, that's kind of one that we, we've moved away from. Uh, Aboriginal is another one and it's in the constitution, right? An Aboriginal person, our rights are recognized and affirmed, right? In the constitution and that uh, is kind of an umbrella term for First Nations, Métis, Inuit. And then of course, First Nations, Métis, Inuit, that is probably the most accurate one because First Nations are all different. We have many, many First Nations groups. Métis are separate to their own, as are the Inuit. So separately, if you know you're just talking about First Nations people, then that's what I suggest. If you're not sure, this is where that other word comes into play, indigenous, right? They're not found anywhere else but here. So uh, the, that is kind of where I land on, on all of this. The terminology that's most widely used across the province in post-secondary and within the Ministry of Education is now indigenous, right? But breaking that down, again, a little bit of an umbrella term, but it's still, um, but it's still, recognized as uh, originating from here or only being found here. So to answer your question, I'm sorry, I can't. For the French, I, I go back and forth, but maybe there is someone else out there that could, could help us out with the proper, if it's uh, Premier uh, First Nations, um, uh, others use Octoton, um, that this is my really, really bad French uh, <laughs> translation or French accent. So, Michelle, see, it goes both ways, right? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, autochtone, autochtone, but yes, that's, that's yeah, the... or indigene premier nation. Yeah, those are the ones that I have also, I've also heard. So, that's uh, that is my little piece on terminology. I really prefer uh, people to use First Nations, Métis, Inuit over FNMI. And I'll be the first one to admit, I used to use FNMI all the time. It's short, it's quick, you just do it. And then someone said, Troy, think about it. What are you doing? And it was like a slap in the face because I realized I am now labeling myself and my relatives and others an acronym. We're not acronym, we're people, right? So I encourage people to say First Nations, Métis, Inuit. If it takes too long and you wanna shorten it up, use indigenous. But if you want to be accurate, use the, uh, the names of the nations. If you know you're talking about the Anishinaabe, you can say the Anishinaabe. Right, so it, there's all kinds of different nations out there, but as you go and as you learn more, this will become even more clear. So I hope that helped a little bit. All right, moving on to terminology in this next activity, before I go to the next slide, uh, we're gonna do interspersed throughout the presentation, quite a few interactive activities. And so this one won't take very long, but I'm gonna show you a series of images and the instructions on the first image, but I wanted to give it to you before we see the image because um, I didn't want you to see the image for too long. What I want you to do is for each image, as I go through, just put in the first words that pop into your head when you see the image, like your initial reactions to those words. And um, Troy and I will do our best to share some of those from the chat as they go through, okay? So here's the first image, image number one. So what word pops in your head when you see this image? And I'll tell you why you're doing this after we do it, because I'm not telling you before, because I want to surprise you. I'll give you another five seconds with that. Four, three, two, one. Just to show you some of the respect, protest, peace, build C45, grassroots, advocates, proud, protest, cold, protectors, conflicted, truth. Next image. And this image? Agreement, official commitment, stage, covenant, equality, yuck, 
I, I deliberately chose this image because I knew it would provoke very different responses. <laughs> Inauthentic, cynical, suspicious commitment. Um, I, I debated whether or not to use this one. Conflicted, I like that. Tree, keep trying, gross, fake, nice. Um, photo up, empty. Okay, mm. moving on to the next image. I want to say performative was in there yes. for that last image. Christy, peace, intricacy, arts, tapestry, beauty, beautiful, pretty, broad, lovely. Christy Belcour, culture, beautiful. Beautiful is coming up a lot because it, it's a beautiful image. Mm. Voice, history, Métis, symbolic, intricate, balance, intertwined. Mm -hmm. All right, next one. And I'm not trying to start like an argument or anything, but this is in my um, history drunk. Yikes, oh dear. <laughs> We're recording this, right? This is, okay, so. Um, ah, Bridget, Bridgerton, it's actually, this is downtown Picton, Ontario, where I teach high school. Genocide, decapitate. This one has not been decapitated. It has had red paint put on it several times. Past, boo, topple. Okay. Complicate, remove, mm -hmm. oppression, damaging, travesty. Okay, last well, last image. And I, I I know we have some other people from Tyananega in here, so I, I, I really should have put a, a trigger warning here. And I apologize for that. Warrior pride, frightful, horrifying, equality, white men with power, careful, protest, sick, disrespectful, horrifying, tragedy, injustice, brutality, wrong, horrifying, scary, why, oppression, Haudenosaunee, racism, white supremacy, bullying. Okay, I'm going to stop reading, um, but you can keep putting, I saw privilege in there. Now, I'm going to move on to the reason why I did this activity in the first place. So um, what I would do with a class generating a list of different words and um, reactions to pictures. We'll be creating a list of words that we could use um, in a, an activity under the umbrella of theater of the oppressed called image theater that can be used in a variety of different ways. And I, we actually um, talked about putting this in because we originally were supposed to do this as an interactive live workshop way back in June of 2020, but for some reason, live workshops weren't happening in 2020. I, can't quite put my finger on it. It might be the same reason why we're online right now. But um, I put a link in here for anyone who doesn't know what Image Theater is. If you, and when you get the, the live version of the workshop, um, you can click right on Image Theater and it'll take you to a website. It gives you a breakdown of uh, Theater of the Oppressed. And we don't have a lot of time tonight and I wanna honor your time. So I'm just gonna go straight to where the definition of Image Theater is and not go over the whole thing around um, the tree and Theater of the Oppressed and Pedagogy of the Oppressed. But for image theater, it uses the human body as a tool of representing feelings, ideas, and relationships. Through sculpting others or using our own body to demonstrate a body position, participants create anything from one person to large group image sculptures that reflect the sculpt sculptor's impression of a situation or oppression. So think about all the words. And now there are over 140 of us here this evening. So that was a lot, those are a lot of words. However, if you had a smaller group and you could come up with, you know, you have everyone come up with their own words in response to the images that, again, provoke a response from your students. Then you can have them explore the, those words symbolically through statues and tableau and um, looking at what those, the, the root of those themes and those words in their own way, provoked by the, the news and by these pictures, or they're the appropriation of those feelings. They're exploring the, the, the words themselves. Now, one other thing I added on here just for, because I said, I thought this was a bonus. If you've never heard of newspaper theater, we're not gonna have a lot of time because this is a whole other workshop, but I put a link on there to a description of newspaper theater as another t um, strategy for theater of the oppressed, just to go over if you wanted to use some news with students and um, from viable sources around indigenous issues I'm thinking um, uh, 1492 Landback Lane. I'm thinking the Mi'kmaq fisheries in Nova Scotia. I'm thinking pipelines and uh, pipelines are thrust. They've never left the uh, collective consciousness, but thrust right back into our spotlight with mm -hmm. certain presidential changes that we do not want to get into tonight. But, um, and I, I'm not going to go through all, th through all this, but it's there as a link for you to look at if it's something that interests you into trying to um, get deeper into these issues 
and uh, this current these current events with a different strategy. So we talk a lot about you know we asked you we asked you why why you're here and again a lot of people are are looking for some great information and Matt has so many awesome activities that that he's going to share and it's really been a part of the work that we've been doing in our board is really trying to build that awareness and that understanding so from I'll give you my perspective as an Indigenous person. For me, it's to right the wrongs. Uh, someone, someone put that, and, and that's how it is for me. You know, I know how I grew up, and we're not going to get into all of the, the not-so-great things. But you know what? There were a lot of times that things weren't so great. And, of course, we always want better for our parents. Or, sorry, for our kids as parents. So, you know what, I want that to be better for my, my children and for my grandchildren. And in order for us to move forward in this good way, we have to have that understanding. So this work, this is about the truth, the truth so that we can move forward, so that people can understand the colonialism and the impacts that colonialism has had on, on our folks, on our people, right? We were once, at, we had good relations that two-row wampum that was referenced earlier, that was about good relations. And it was bound in peace, friendship, and respect. And those were all agreed upon. So somewhere that fell off. And this work is about getting back to those things. So, you know, of course I could go on a lot more, but let's leave it at that and get into some of these activities mm -hmm. that we can share. Yeah, and before I want to add, because um, like, my perspective is a, as a, a white colonial settler background. I mean, literally, um, uh, it, where I live is called the loyal, loyalist um, uh, country, because um, yeah, it, you're taking that face, Troy. And I want to say, literally, whenever anyone tries to say that to me about loyalist country, I, I like to bring up the fact that I actually am a descendant of loyalist settlers. Um, if you call, want to call them loyalist settlers from the uh, American War of, uh, of Independence. And um, I think that's what, to me, why this work is so important, because voices were silenced for so long, so long, that we have to be privileging and put, bring these voices to the forefront in all capacities, not just in a class that is geared towards Indigenous voices like the NB, NBE English course or the NAC art course or the... Um, or any other course, I teach the NDW and the NDG and all course codes. Course codes aside, the privileging of these voices, um, of all disservice voices through colonial history, need to be at the forefront in whatever um, we're teaching. And I think that um, the more, the path forward, and I'm totally um, paraphrasing, but uh, when Murray Sinclair was still the head of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, he said it was education that got us into this mess, and it's education that will get us out. And I, I, I don't think that's naive at all. I think it's a long road and I think it's a lot of work, but the work is what's most important. And that's why we're here tonight. It didn't happen overnight. And right, as I often tell my colleagues, the work that we're doing is not, we're not in a sprint, we're in a marathon, right? So, and it's important that for me as an indigenous person, to have someone like Matt, who is an accomplice in the work, right? More than an ally. An ally is great. We, we all need allies. But honestly, what we need in, in this work are more accomplices, which means that these are the folks who are standing right beside us, getting their hands dirty, or use a sports analogy, who are going into the corners with us, right? So um, that is also so important for us. And I can tell you, as an Indigenous person, it means a lot. And you may come up against uh, some opposition every now and again from an Indigenous person who may be a little bit leery. We have, there's a reason that we're a little leery. But you have to know that if you are continuing to do the work in the good way, things will be fine. Sorry, Matt, I went off oh, script. No. <laughs> no, hey, hey, you're allowed to go off script, okay? I, uh, I like to improvise. 
<laughs> so uh, as a drama teacher and performer. Um, so appropriation of vo- that led us nicely into appropriation of voice or appropriation versus appreciation. So uh, we wanted to touch on this briefly uh, and it's going to lead into our next um, slide and resource that we're going to share with you. But um, it's often people seem uh, wary and or um, unsure of what we mean when we're talking about appropriation versus appreciation. And I know that um, for me, when I think of appropriation, um, I think of, of, that, of that taking and that utilizing without permission. And Troy, do you want to elaborate on that from your perspective? And well, um, I was just looking at a comment Matt, and it just made me kind of do a little bit of a squirrel moment. Can you repeat that for me? Oh, I was just asking about your take on appropriation of voice. Yeah, the appropriation, um, well, honestly, from, again, from a First Nations perspective, it's almost like um, it's, it's so disrespectful, right? Because when you have people representing who you are, people have to understand that our voices are built upon generations and generations and generations of people who have lived here for thousands and thousands of years. The information, the knowledge, that traditional knowledge that has been um, developed in this land, has, it, it's so important. So when, when voice is appropriated or anything, when the culture is appropriated, it's that we talk about ethics a lot. There's responsibility and there's ethics that need to be at play here. And when our voices and our cultures are being appropriated, there, there's none of that, right? So it, it's, you know, some people will even call it theft, right? So it, it's uh, beyond disrespectful. It, 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 it hurts because you're, you're taking information, you're taking knowledge, you're taking so many pieces and it's almost... Uh, minimizing it because there's no acknowledgement to where it's come from. It's just being taken and used for other people's benefit. That's where it really falls down. If you can't acknowledge, if you can't acknowledge where the information has come from or whose voices you, you are um, sharing or trying to um, connect with, then you're doing a disservice, right? So yeah, and that question, those questions really drove us to what built this opportunity that came about through OTF, um, which was um, we were discussing, and I know Co- um, Code um, reached out to FMI EAO and several different um, uh, knowledge keepers. Troy was one of our consultants on a document in a good way. And Troy, you said in a good way earlier. And I was like, oh, <laughs> see, that's a good setup for later on when referencing this uh, particular document. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the entire document, but on our code website, under our resources, you can find, um, you can find the entire in a good way document, which uh, addresses issues of integrating and utilizing indigenous issues and content in drama and dancing a meaningful and safe way by providing definitions and examples of cultural appropriation and appropriation of voice guidelines created in consultation with members of FNMI EAO and indigenous artists and educators. One of them right here with me this evening, a quick reference chart of suggestions and best practices. And then when you click on right here, it'll take you to the PDF document. My computer doesn't wanna work too quickly. And it gives you um, a definition of appropriation, which very quickly um, is taking intellectual property, traditional knowledge, cultural expressions or artifacts from someone else's culture without permission. And one of the key things that I wanna highlight really came about um, right down here when they talk about um, it's particularly sensitive when it comes from a minority group that has been oppressed or exploited in other ways or the object of appropriation is particularly sensitive. And if you scroll through the document, you can find a series of guidelines, again, made in, uh, con- hey, look, Troy's name's right there. Mm-hmm. Um, respect and reciprocity. Seek permission first. Build a relationship with knowledge holders. Acknowledge traditional territory. Involve the local indigenous community. Take time to reflect on the project with all partners involved. 
disclose the origin of all indigenous knowledge is accessed and used. Exercise extreme caution when using the internet as a resource, as there are many inaccuracies and misrepresentations circulating. And looking at resources, always check to see whose voice is telling the story or providing the information. Now, we're obviously, we're the Council of Ontario Drama and Dance Educators, but I, I like to think these suggestions are, are, are accessible in so many different ways. And um, so, like, things to do in this chart, invite an elder to give a teaching, avoid teaching about sacred items. Um, again, use Indigenous play stories to discuss universal themes, avoid performing plays with Indigenous characters using non-Indigenous actors when in a performance setting. Stay in the shared history, treaty, education, water, Mother Earth, solar system. Avoid teaching about cultural practices and tokenism. So replicating or recreating artifacts or experiences with students. Um, and just super quick, um, use contemporary materials. This is key because we want to avoid that stereotype mm -hmm. or that tokenism about just staying in the past. I mean, here I have my wonderful colleague, uh, fantastic Haudenosaunee man who I talked to, who is a contemporary man. He does not live in the past. He lives today, right now, right down the road from me. And um, access those stories, access those positive stories and look at the fullness of history and a whole bunch of resources and key documents down there as well for you to peruse. And again, that link, if you look, is right embedded in our presentation for you to look at. Yeah, it really is such a great resource and on so many fronts. And, and I, you know, I, I just have to echo um, it. It's important to have balance, right? It's important. We know about all of the trauma and all of the things that have happened or you are, are learning about them. It's important for us to have the balance and show that resilience, right? To show the resilience, to show the humor, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of humor out there. One of one of uh, um, one of our famous, if you will, uh, playwrights, Drew Hayden Taylor. It's hard to ever watch one of his plays or read his book and not laugh. He brings so much humor into it because you know it's a cliche. Laughter is a, a medicine, but it truly is. So um, you know those are all parts that we have to that we have to bring in. So um, what, one of the things that I wanted to share, and we threw this, this slide in, because I know there are some folks here that are, are teaching in our elementary panel, and within the FNMI EAO website, the, the, we have a document as well, and it is very similar to what you see on, on the screen here. We have it for junior as well, and we also have a secondary one that you can check out. And I don't know, Michelle, if you have the link for that, but it is embedded somewhere. <laughs> Sorry, is but this it, in any event, we can make sure that is it's it this link? Successful. No, it's um, not this link. No, which one? Which one is it? I'm we'll make sure it's act, it's active in the slideshow, so people will I be think, able yeah, to see that. I mean, yeah. which one is it? Uh, I don't have the link, but I. But you will receive them tomorrow. Everybody, yeah. everybody will receive the slides, the recording, and all the links. And since you receive the slides, you're going to have all the links that are on the slides. Everybody will yeah. receive. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, Troy, no, can I take great. one second to address a question? Someone asked me a question from earlier. I just want before I forget. Yes, to get of course. Um, so uh, someone had asked about the picture exercise, and I, I, I just want to reiterate um, had, uh, what I said earlier, just to make sure that everyone was clear. So the pictures themselves were the one to provoke you to give me the words that then you would explore through um, uh, the image theater exercises. So they are the words that you'd be embodying, um, looking at them, like what they represent, what uh, the dualism of them, uh, the, uh, the diversity of the understanding of, of power or oppression or of uh, conflict or all the words that we created. Now there are over 140 of us, so that was a lot of words and you wouldn't get that many from a class. Well a really awesome class, which I'm sure you all have. But um, so the word, the pictures themselves were used as a, a way to provoke. So we were using um, some older images, images of, uh, of art. Um, actually, Christy Belcour, I chose that one, Wisdom of the Universe, because um, with her permission, it was recreated at the back of St. Andrew's Church in Picton, Ontario, where I work. And I take students there every, every year to look at it. And it's um, it's the and she actually uh, attended uh, the unveiling of the work, the uh, recreation of it, of the mural, and it was and spoke to it. 
So like, that's why I included that image. But that's why the images were used as a way to provoke um, responses that would then be used in image theater in a variety of different ways. Sorry, Troy. Yeah, no, no, it, it was, that's, that's good because um, it just gave me a moment to remember what else I wanted to share. <laughs> and it was, and it was around. And sometimes my mind gets racing so fast, and my mouth can't keep up. But um, one of the things that I wanted to share, that a knowledge keeper that I've spent some time with, uh, quite often will remind us that um, it's not the responsibility of teachers in schools to teach our culture. That's our job as Indigenous people, as First Nations people. It's our job to teach and share our culture. But what you can focus on is, is something that Matt did highlight is, is focusing on the history, the truth, the, the uh, pieces around treaty and all of those. There's so many aspects that you can touch on that you don't have to go into the culture, right? So that was just one of the other pieces that I wanted to highlight. Go ahead, Matt. Okay, so now uh, earlier this evening, I asked everyone to get some really complex um, materials together, a piece of paper and a pen or pencil. I know, who has a pen or pencil around anymore? And you can type this out as well. And I, bear with me because it's a timed activity. So I'm gonna give you the instructions first and then I'm gonna give you your, your stimulus for what you're about to do. So what you're gonna do is, um, and, and again, like if you just mainly wanna like actually just pick, kind of pay attention to what happens at the end. And I'm gonna do the activity. I have my paper and I have my pen here. Um, I'm gonna read you a quote from Sir John A. Macdonald in relation to residential schools. And what I want you to do in the, the five minutes I'm going to give you is I want you to write a letter to Sir John A. Macdonald about residential schools, pretty much. And I want you to articulate your feelings and have a, a discussion one way because you're sending this letter i mean he won't get it he's dead but um around the quotation but anything else you might be bringing to the discussion as well maybe you're feeling conflicted because um you didn't know certain things and now you um don't want to uh you, you're having a hard time meshing together um, the the different histories that uh, you were taught before and now and i put a link here to a resource. If you've never gone to the Indigenous Corporate Training um, Incorporated website, it's um, fantastic. If you've never read 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act by Bob Joseph, um, who is all over this website, uh, it's a fantastic resource. And so um, you can find yourself in a very deep dive in this website um, through many different resources um, that will help you um, add to your repertoire of uh, and uh, arsenal for Indigenous education. So I'm going to scroll down to one, a quote that is um, a pretty common one that some of you have probably heard already, probably most of you. When the school is on the reserve, the child lives with its parents, who are savages. And though he may learn to read and write, his habits and training mode of thought are Indian. He is simply a savage who can read and write. It has been strongly impressed upon myself as head of the department the Indian children should be withdrawn as much as possible from the parental influence. And the only way to do that would be to put them in the central training industrial schools that will acquire the habits and modes of thought of white men. I'm going to read that one more time. When the school is on the reserve, the child lives with his parents who are savages. And though he may learn to read and write, his habits and training mode of thought are Indian. He is simply a savage who can read and write. It has been strongly impressed upon myself as head of the department that Indian children should be withdrawn as much as possible from the parental influence. And the only way to do that would be to put them in central training industrial schools where they will acquire the habits and modes of thought of white men. So I want you to write a raw, unedited response to that quote to Sir John A. McDonald. And you're going to have five minutes to do it starting right now.
while you're all doing the exercise, if you can still hear me, um, I just want to let you know, because I've, um, I got the question, I just want to let you know that everything that we are sharing with you today, including the slides and the recording of the presentation, we will share with uh, you tomorrow by email. And um, I will see if I can also turn the chat box into a document and maybe share the content of the chat, bo chat box as well, so that um, all the ideas and suggestions and and responses that have been posted in the chat box are available to everyone. I I, I won't promise, but I think I can do it. But I'll I'll check that uh, after the session. But definitely, you get the slides. Definitely, you will get the slides and the recording and the links. That's for sure. And I just see that people are leaving. Um, I can see, I can see that some people are leaving. And obviously, if you have things to do, if you have to um, take care of your kids, or if you have other things to do, obviously we understand that you're leaving. Uh, not a problem, obviously. But I, I also want you to know that the the webinar is not over. You know, we're still <laughs> coming back uh, after this exercise. The, the webinar is not over. We. We have, I think, another 15 minutes uh, to wrap up the, the webinar. So if you can stay with us for another 15, 20 minutes, it would be wonderful. We would love that. And I see the, the message from Josette um, asking me not to share the names of the participants if I share the, the, the chat comments. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a very valid point. So I will see, uh, I've never sh shared the chat, uh, to be honest with you. We usually don't share it. Um, so I'm not going to um, commit to that. I'm, I just, I'm going to check with uh, my colleagues at OTF what they think. And if I share the chat, I will see if I can remove the names of, um, of the people that have shared the ideas uh, through the chat box. So uh, I'm not going to share. If, if I see that I can't do that, then I will not share the chat. I will keep it private. I will keep it secret. So Josette, there's no worry. Um, all of you who have shared the ideas through the chat, in um, okay. assu assuming that it was secret, I will not share it if um, if it shows the names of the participants. So I will not do that. Don't worry. Less than a minute. Yeah, I will share the links for sure. I will share the slides. I will share the links and I will share the recording uh, and the chat because uh, Matthew and, and Troy had uh, mentioned that there were hundreds of you. Sharing. 30 seconds sharing with us so many uh, great ideas. I, I wanted to share, to share the chat, which is something that I have never done, but I will not do it unless I can make it anonymous. So you don't have to worry. Ten seconds. All right, time. Even if you're not done, you're done. Okay, um, you don't have any more um, uh, that you're allowed to uh, to do. You're not allowed to do any more. So, um, 
I actually, so um, I'm going to, I'm going to share mine and I'm going to be very honest with you. I am um, been doing this work for a long time. I, um, we had a recently had a consultation in Prince Edward County about the statue. I wrote a dissertation. There was a public consultation. It was recommended to have it to be removed by the working group and then council decided to keep it. Um, even though all that work was done. So uh, feelings are a little raw still. Um, so I, this is what I wrote. Sir John A, as a father and a parent, as a human being, I cannot understand how this country could advocate for the removal of children from their parents. The ruin, the destruction, and the devastation that this country wrought upon these communities is still being felt today. It ripples through generations. We have generations of work ahead of us in order to fix what has been done. We have a duty to reconcile. You left us with this. This is your legacy. When I hear people talk about canceling you, I cringe. I want people to learn more, not less. We need to know the fullness of our history, not hide from our colonial past. This is not canceling. This is recognizing. This is how we move forward. Ignoring what has happened maintains the status quo. And that is unacceptable. Troy, did you write one? No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think you did. All right. So, no, I um, was actually starting to uh, respond to some of the some of the questions that were in the chat. And then I thought, oh, that's too big. I will just talk about it. So, but let me, that's great. Let me, yeah. So let talk me break about down. that cancel part, would you? Well, I mean, because like people talk about cancel culture, right? Like we're, we're trying to get, erase things, to get rid of things because we don't, we find them offensive. But um, I mean, whenever I hear talk, talk about Sir John A being canceled, I think we, what, you're canceling the truth. You're canceling what we know, what the man said himself and, and documents uh, in writing and, and was recorded, um, obviously not with audio because, you know, 1800s, but um, it's, it's not canceling, it's honoring the actual history. And people say you can't rewrite history. And I think you need to talk to a historian because I mean, like that's when we discover things, we add to the story. That's the, that's the study of history. As you know, you're a history guy. I mean, like we need to honor those stories and we didn't honor, we didn't listen to those stories. So it's not canceling. It's, it's making the right amendments to what we thought we knew because we were ignoring those things. And so I want to talk about how we could use those letters. Now, I, I know one person was in this workshop with me. I, I adapted this activity from a workshop I took at a code conference in 2016, I believe. So many conferences, so little time. Uh, with Rob Kempson, who's an amazing educator, director, and performer. So if you ever see Rob Kempson come up at a conference or a workshop or a webinar um, through any organization, you should take that workshop. But stay with this one right now. Don't go away. And um, so uh, with those letters, though, we could have students get together, share their letters with each other. We could have them then possibly take letters and mash them together with common commonalities, adding their voice, layering it on top of each other. They could, um, uh, like, I, I did this activity similar to this today with my senior drama class, where, um, uh, like, we're actually working together now. We just returned to in-school teaching on Monday uh, because we're in the Hastings Prince Edward School Board. And um, which is one of the seven areas that we're allowed to return in school teaching. And so one activity they did today was um, we actually looked at the Red Dress Project and Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. And they wrote, in a, in a nutshell, I could go on about the explanation about what they did, but they wrote letters to anything they wanted in response to the issues around missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and the 231 calls for justice. And then mashed their letters together and created a choral reading and added movement and music to it, which took like four hours. So it's a long activity, but it's the students' responses to these issues and uh, that are visceral and it's utilizing their voices. Um, and I always find, and Troy and I have had this conversation several times, especially when you're talking about trying to build empathy and understanding that we have to make them feel like we have to hear their voices on these things and help develop their voices. And then hopefully through the work, we'll develop uh, allies and accomplices. I saw co-conspirators earlier in the, in the chat. Um, Troy and I totally cons conspire together. 
Um, and uh, I would definitely say that's, that's an apt uh, title. But um, so this activity can be used in several different ways. Think about in your NBE English class. Um, why are we not um, having students and, make, and actually the time uh, using five minutes, it makes us, it really puts us on the spot. And if you can, I know like I have students who um, I let use laptops or tablets and um, some who struggle um, with writing. So they'll actually record, they'll go off somewhere and they'll record their responses an audio response. So there are a lot of ways to modify or accommodate students um, and their needs in this activity. But the activity itself is about utilizing that student voice in response to what they're learning. And you can do some amazing things with that. And um, that's a whole other workshop though. We could keep going and going and going on that one. But I really wanted to show you that even if you just kept it as a writing activity, they could take their rough piece and they could refine it. Um, and they, it could become uh, like a, maybe a, a call to action within the class that everyone stands up and reads their letters. Um, and you can choose all sorts of subjects and all sorts of different ways to provoke that discussion. And check the chat here, make sure we don't have any questions. Well, thank you for loving yeah, I like that writing activity as well. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot, there are some questions um, that have come up, but we do have a section for a Q&A uh, yeah. shortly. Yeah, so we can yeah. maybe just- uh, Keep going along here. Keep going. So one of the things that Matt has, has shared, and I believe I have as well, is that one of the reasons I think that uh, we've been successful in our area is because we are working in these partnerships. It's so important. And one of the things that we talk about when we're talking about appreciation versus the appropriation, the appreciation is engagement. It's all around engagement. And when we're engaging with our, our partners, our knowledge keepers, our community members, we're doing the work alongside, we're doing it collaboratively, right? That is key to success. And it's not just once, it's not just consulting with someone once. Matt doesn't just reach out to me or he didn't just reach out to me once and say, Troy, I need this. Or can you explain this? And then boom, he's an expert. It doesn't work like that. As a good friend of mine said, you know what? The relationships and that engagement, what it represents isn't a cup of coffee. It's pots of coffee or pots of tea, right? It's spending that time in, although you may think, but we don't have that kind of time. I challenge you to think about that. That's what we're saying. You need to make the time. It needs to be a part of the work, right? If we are going to have meaningful partnership, we have to put in the time, right? And many butter tarts. Hashtag I was say, no raisins. <laughs> <laughs> I was typing to Melissa in the chat. You, would you put raisins in those butter tarts? Oh, no, thank you, Melissa, because both Troy and I, um, we're, we're, we're hardcore no raisins um, yeah. in our butter tarts. Sorry, everyone. So, yes, that is, my yes, but that's, see, this is what happens to us on Twitter all the time. See, we get going on, on butter tarts and raisins are no raisins. So Vigon called me an, an anti-raisinist or he called me a raisinist. So not an anti, but a raisinist. <laughs> so anyway, but yes, it is all about relationship. And for that true appreciation, I can't, I can't, uh, suggest strongly enough it's about it is about that engagement right and spending that time that's when you're going to to grow and learn more um you know matt alluded to it he certainly doesn't know everything i certainly don't know everything and i've been doing concerted work and learning i've grown up i grew up in my community i only didn't the only time i haven't lived here in my community was when i went off to school so there's still so much that I have to learn and I'm the first person to know it, but you know, one of the biggest things, and, and we threw this in here as a reminder, if you're not sure, ask, don't guess because guessing can be costly <laughs> for sure. And um, it's so much easier. It, it, it's 
it's just so much easier to reach out. And everybody has someone in their board, every board, every board in the province has someone who's in my position, who is an Indigenous lead or a, a someone who is dedicated to Indigenous education in your board. So reach out to them. There's organizations like the uh, FNMIEAO. They're there to support the teachers to do this work, right? So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of places that you can reach out to if you're not sure. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you to do that. How do we have this green slash through our slideshow now? What happened there? I have no <laughs> idea. You know I what, ignore it. It doesn't exist. Yeah, um, it, it's ignore it because I, I, I've been looking how I can erase it, but I, I, cannot, I don't know how to erase it, so let's ignore it. So in <laughs> essence of time, uh, we're, I see the time and we want to get to the Q&A very shortly. I want to just talk very briefly about this experience. So uh, two years ago, in, in con consultation with Troy and other members of uh, Tyananega Mohawk Territory, uh, 14 students and I uh, created a, an anthology production called A Call to Action that we presented uh, in, at elementary schools, at our school to multiple audiences. Um, Troy came and gave us his feedback on what we created after being a consultant on everything that we created together. And it was all about utilizing response to provoking responses from the students and the creation of the material that we use. So like our transitional pieces between different scenes were like um, letters students wrote to um, Justin Trudeau around um, oil water advisories. Um, we did an entire movement and piece using just statistics from missing and murdered indigenous women and girls that we used. Um, we, we tried it with dresses, it didn't work. We had uh, a lot of red dresses. We ended up with going roses and white roses being replaced and one person being left alone at the end. And it was, um, we also built in, it was a 45 minute production with then um, time for a Q and A with the students and, and myself and everyone involved in the performance after the performance. And that was the most val valuable part, uh, I would say of the, of the entire production. And we were lucky to take this to YPT um, at the Children, Youth and Performance Conference in 2019. And so it was a really great experience about how to utilize issues and the voice of the students involved to create and respond. And I would spend more time. There's a link actually to um, here if you, when you get to the slideshow to a, a, an article that has a, a description of a lot of the process and also the um, students' voices on their experience. So we're going to move on because uh, we're getting really late in the day here. All right. And super, super quick. Um, again, there's a link here where it says picture books for provocation. I'm a big believer that picture books um, work at all age groups, not just in elementary school. So um, uh, whether we're talking like process drama or story drama, um, utilizing the pictures and the stories to, to help students create and provoke deeper thinking. And um, if you're looking for an opportunity, possibly just next week, um, I'm going to click on this right here, code we're offering. If you're a code member, uh, we have a workshop on February 4th with internationally renowned educator Patrice Baldwin called Making Sense of Stories Through Drama. Though the workshop is all about um, the story of Queen of the Falls, about um, Annie Edison Taylor's journey over the Niagara Falls in a barrel, the techniques and the strategies are applicable in so many different ways. And so um, it's right there on the code website if you're um, interested and want to take a look at that. Hey, Q&A. We're there now. <laughs> I wasn't rushing, I swear. I was just, I, I know that I see we're losing a lot of people. Um, it was advertised as 4 to 5.30. So um, uh, it's not 5.30 yet. So if you're like, hey, these guys went over time, I will, I will remind you, it is not 5.30. So if you could actually, I'm just going to, um, I'm going to leave this right now. We're going to come back to this presentation in a second. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. And I'm going to just go to the participation mm -hmm. list. And if you have a question, if you could just put your hand up mm -hmm. and then Troy and I will, you can unmike and Troy and I would answer that question. There are the any most questions? Burning questions. At the bottom. You could, also put, you could also put it in the chat if you really want to put it in the chat. Of course. There's you been can. lots in the chat. <laughs> and unfortunately, I don't know if we're going to be able to get to all of them. But uh, can I just talk to, real quick to one of the things that, that popped in is someone asked for some advice sure. around, around using masks and uh, bringing that in. Um, and I, I, I'm not a drama teacher. I know that masks have been a part of drama forever. 
however, for, for me, I talk to our, our teachers here. Uh, I, I try to steer them away from it, quite honestly. And that is because for the Haudenosaunee people in, in my culture, masks are, they're, they're only used at certain times and it's very, very, very ceremonial and, and sacred. Not, it's not a, one of those things that we publicize, right? So it has a different meaning for me, for my nation, right? For uh, folks in BC, I would say you have to ask them if you're talking about the Haida or the Salish when they're, they have some very, very intricate masks as well. Um, I would suggest you talk to them about how to do it. But generally, uh, if you were going to say in First Nations communities, uh, masks were also used, I would say just that. They were used for different purposes. They were used some for ceremony, some that were very public, but others uh, were very private. So just know that masks, you know, played a role in different societies in different ways. So that was one of the, one of the pieces that I, I wanted to share. And that was way too much to type into the chat. And I have a really good, there's someone just came up, uh, there was a good question about um, French resources. And I want to draw your attention to, um, uh, there's a link to Good Minds bookstore at Six Nations um, in that slide around picture books. And a lot of the books that I have in that slide are in French translation. And also in the language, some of them, not all of them. So um, if you're looking for some, for, they have, uh, Troy, uh, you might know more about this than I do, but there are quite a few French resources on yeah. Good Minds. Yeah. yeah. So I would look, and, and Good Minds, it's, it's an indigenous corporation, um, and um, profits go back to the community sub portion. So it's, um, it's a great resource. Mm -hmm. um, are they authentic is the question. Yes. Um, Troy, you could probably yeah. speak to that more I'll than I could. Sure, all of the resources that uh, Good Minds sells have all been vetted, right? So you can, you can trust them. So a lot of people will ask that question, well, how do we know, where do we find good resources? How do we know whether or not it, it's good or not? And uh, that's one of those things, right? Again, all, I'm gonna promote your, your indigenous lead within your board. And you know, I see someone's been shouting out for Simcoe County. And absolutely, they've been, uh, they've been doing a great job, as have a lot of other boards. It's just reaching out to that Indigenous lead that you have within your board. And I would, I would venture to say that uh, there have been a lot of books, book lists created through, I know uh, CBC has great book lists. And, but yes, absolutely go to Good Minds and look at what they have to offer. And they have, they have them broken down by subject, by theme, by age. Um, the, the, they have the full gamut. So it's definitely somewhere I would point my everyone to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he does all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so next question, teaching world, and I think they've answered their own question in here, but I'm gonna throw it to you, Troy. Teaching world religions next semester, one of the units is indigenous spirituality. We do have an elder come and speak to our class. How can I teach appreciation and not appropriation? I think by having the elder come into class, you're doing just that, right? Again, it's when we're talking about spirituality, and I know this is a really tough one for our Catholic folks, is that it, I know it's part of it, but I strongly encourage when it comes to the Indigenous aspect, have Indigenous people doing it. Because this is where you know, the lines can get a little askew and you might step on, step on or over that line and, you know, get yourselves in trouble. And I know that's also a big fear, right? I, I, if there's one thing I hear from the teachers more than anything else, we're afraid of doing it wrong. We're afraid of messing up or offending someone. So we just don't do it. But I'm going to say, but if you don't do it, it's just perpetuating, right? It's as, as Matt said, it's that status quo, and that's what we have to um, we have to stop, right? We just have to do better. So by reaching out to your community, accessing your indigenous education leads, right, uh, you can break these things down, and it will be full appreciation. Okay. So one person said, um, "How do you address folks who say we can't judge characters from the past by today's standards?" 
Oh, thank you so much for asking that again. I saw that coming up. The way that I always, I always answer that is if we don't acknowledge, if when we say that, what we're saying is that we're not acknowledging all of the people who fought against the oppression at the time it was happening. If anyone, see, if anyone thinks that there weren't First Nations people who were against letting their kids be taken to residential school, well, again, we need to have a talk. talk. <laughs> anytime, anytime that oppressive things were happening, Indigenous people were standing up for themselves. So by not acknowledging that, that's how I look at it, right? Matt, what about you? Well, I like to think that um, I had this conversation recently with someone um, about when they talked about how we couldn't ju judge someone from the past. And I said, um, by today's standards, and I said, well, you know, when we still feel or we still see um, policy being developed on that template, like the Canadian government policy, if we think of uh, what Sowetan, if we think of uh, different pipeline policies, um, priorities and um, things that clearly showing the uh, uh, white supremacist na nature of, of legislation at times around, I just even think water, well, water advisories. I think um, Jagmeet Singh said it best when someone said during the last federal election, well, that would cost like $5 billion if you were just to take care of all that. And he said, would you say the same thing if we were talking about Montreal? Would you say the same thing if we were talking about Toronto or Vancouver? No, you wouldn't. It'd just get done. So, I mean, yeah. like, when we see that, 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 that this mindset has carried on, then we can, we, can, we can look at that as the catalyst as to what we're still doing. And I say we as a collective Canadian society, not like as in you stop doing this, but as we need to recognize that these things are still being perpetuated as a system. Yeah. And yeah. if we don't, and so, I mean, like, we can draw that from those colonial roots. So yes, we can judge those acts because they laid the groundwork for everything that came after. Yeah, and, and Carol, she, she made a really good point, right? To, to that, the policies and acts like the Indian Act still impact us today. Like mm -hmm. I said to start, when we're talking about terminology, I have that little card and it still, it still rules a lot of things that I can and cannot do. So, um, this yes, qu this question here, um, uh, I want you to address this one because this affects me a little bit too. Um, could you talk about the blanket ceremony, uh, the, the blanket exercise used by teachers in the classroom without an Indigenous leader? Um, so non-Indigenous teachers leading one. There seems to be some debate about it, whether or not. So we're talking about the, um, the, uh, the blanket exercise. And um, so what are your thoughts on non-Indigenous te teachers leading that exercise? Well, I... Uh... Melissa, I'd, I'm not sure how things are, how things work in, in your board, but I have actually spent time with, with teachers in our board doing it, right? So if, if you've been, let's just for argument's sake, because I know, I know what's going on, but let's just say for argument's sake, you were a participant once and then you thought, oh, I'm going to do this too. And then you started doing it. I, I'm going to say, whoa, you need to learn a little bit more. But when you have someone who has, who is well-versed and who can address some of the questions that, that come up at the end, as you're, you know, debriefing, if you will, about the exercise itself, I think it's important to be able to uh, have that knowledge. You can't just download the PDF off of Kairos and just away you go. There has to be, um, there has to be caution there because there are so many triggering things if you have some indigenous people, but there's also some triggering things for non-indigenous people too, right? So I think that, that it's okay for non-indigenous people to conduct the blanket exercise. It's a really great way to go through a, the colonial history of Canada in an interactive way but I think you need to have a little bit of background before you do it. And by a little, I don't mean just once or twice, but you have to be fairly well-versed. I hope yeah, that- and some people have asked, Yeah, and some people have asked in the chat, like what is the blanket exercise? Someone had put a, um, a link to Kairos and mm -hmm. read, read there are rules and, and regulations around that. Um, there's a little bit of a, 
a debate happening in the chat as well. Um, and um, so, I mean, I, 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 we can't get to everything today because we do have one, a couple other things we need to share with you just before we leave. But I'm trying to see. Um, so there's a good question from someone asking about is the term Indian offensive? And then they reference the novel Indians on Vacation by Thomas King, which okay. also is a little problematic these days, is it not? Thomas King? Yeah, Did that, won't yeah. Go, yeah I don't want to go there right now. But um, so one of the things with Thomas King is like uh, some people will say terminology is also generational, right? Depending on when you grew up, like, you know, in my parents' era, everybody was Indian. So now people their age will still use that term because they'll be staunch and say, well, when I was growing up, they were called Indians, right? Uh, anyway, Thomas King is one of these people that doesn't seem to want to let that go. <laughs> so I love his work. I love his writing. Absolutely. But he does use that term a lot. And, uh, you know, it, he does address why he does in at some point, I think it's out on, on the internet somewhere, but yes, I, I'm not a big fan of when people are using the word Indian but I guess it would be like uh, other people. Re it, it's about reclaiming, taking back the power, right? So that's why some people do it. And that it's become, it's something that a lot of our, our youth are doing too. They're using the, the um, NDN in mm -hmm. social media, right? It's like just taking the power back, reclaiming it, right? So that's, that's one one way of looking at it but again i'm not i'm not a big fan of it but that's me so we so, want to get to this end row here yeah. yeah i i i do need to give a plug to the fnmieo a little bit more oh 100 yeah this link uh there are so many amazing resources that are there and check with your board or or you could even go email and check with fnmieao there are different uh, places that you can get membership. Um, sorry, not different places. There's two different types of membership, either one personally or your whole board. The one for your, just an individual is $50 for the year. The one for your board is a thousand dollars. And again, there, uh, your board may already have a subscription and on there, you can find all kinds of different resources for students, for teachers. There are events uh, happening all the time we'll call them events but they're they're really really good learning opportunities and they are also uh, recorded and made available so that people can go back they i've been a part of a lot of them and they're fantastic and i know matt is a big fan so oh, yeah. um, it you know I, I i really can't speak enough to the people who are who are doing so much work work with this because they have full-time jobs this is this is things that uh, these are things that people are working on uh, in addition to their full time jobs. So it's just fantastic stuff. Isn't and, that what uh, we're doing right now? Well, yes, <laughs> but these guys are these guys are like on another level. Right. <laughs> so there's some some more information. And again, all of these links will be made available um, are there for when you get them, when you get all the slides. So. So, yeah, I'll go off. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah. And because before everyone logs off, this is our contact information right here. Um, uh, there are a lot of burning questions. And um, uh, if you want to get in touch with us, we are very open to having these discussions. And so, both Troy and I, um, our contact information is right there. Absolutely. Michelle, thank you. Yeah, um, for all your so supports too. My, Absolutely, my pleasure. I'm just going to jump back in for a second, if I may, uh, and just quickly share my screen again. Um, Here, I'll start. Yeah, there we go. I, oh, sorry. I um, <clears throat> I was going to um, elaborate a little bit, but we are running late, so and I think that everybody is eager to go back to their families and their children and prepare dinner and all of that. So, uh, I'm just going to really thank you, uh, Matthew and Troy. Uh, for this fantastic presentation. 
um, interesting topics, uh, challenging topics, things that we don't usually address uh, in our uh, webinars. Uh, we, of course, do a lot of webinars about mathematics and things like that, but it was really interesting. And I, I think we can uh, plan to maybe do more uh, of these webinars next season because there was such an interest and such a large number of people joining us today. Uh, it shows that there's clearly uh, uh, an interest and that people have lots of questions and people still have a lot to learn about how to and handle these uh, um, topics that can be sometimes a little delicate. So I just want to remind everybody one more time. I, I want to, of course, thank you all for participating. I see I can hear you leaving, but I want to thank you all for participating. <laughs> and I want to tell you again that you will receive tomorrow the link to this webinar, the slides. Uh, and uh, the recording, and also a little evaluation form, uh, a little evaluation questionnaire, and we will ask you to please fill that evaluation questionnaire, and then... Uh, evaluation? Well, you know, it's not... It's <laughs> not <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> just to see how we can improve. It was fantastic, but, you know, we can always improve. <laughs> and uh, so that, that's it, and um, I just want to thank you again, Troy and Matthew. You're welcome. And thank everybody. And I hope that I will see you again next season. I do want to say one thing. I know because uh, the email went out said four to five, but on, on the way, all the things that were advertised at four to five thirty. So I think there was just a disconnect in that way. So, <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, I hope for those who stayed for that extra half an hour, which Error, was planned, Error, you, yeah. you had fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was fantastic. Yeah. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you so no, much. I'm going to end the, the recording and the session. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.